You know, we've done several episodes focusing on digital transformation as a topic. And one of the first things that jumps out at you as you think about digital transformation is how meaningless the term has has become and how important it is to to have a working definition uh, as we as we dive into topics of digital transformation. The, the word tr- digital transformation has taken on new relevance with the rise of AI and, and numerous business leaders, all business leaders, trying to think about what this new technology um, that actually isn't that new, but is now uh, tangible in a way that it wasn't before. What does it mean for their strategy and, and how they're going to market? What is it going to do to user behaviors and expectations? A lot of questions, very good questions uh, that, that none of us know the answers to quite yet, fr- frankly. Um, you know, and just to drive home how, how important this is, McKinsey just published a book uh, in June of this year, um, Rewired, a McKinsey Guide to Outcompeting in the Age of Digital and AI, which is focused on this topic of digital transformation. And, you know, they, they, they describe digital transformation as the fundamental rewiring of how an organization operates. The goal of digital transformation should be to build a competitive advantage by continuously deploying tech at scale to improve customer experience and lower costs. Interesting. Now that the intersection of customer experience and cost reduction is, is an interesting angle that, uh, for them to take. The tech at scale is, is notable um, and sort of unique, you know, and, and something that we can dive into another time. But the fact is, is that this topic is still very relevant and continues to be a struggle for business le- leaders to ascertain where they are in their journey, whether or not they're on the right path. Um, and, and again, I think the definition itself is, is, part of, is one of the culprits. Uh, just by example, I, um, in preparing for this episode, I, I uh, read a Harvard Business Review article called The Essential Components of Digital Transformation. And they state, uh, quote, In fact, the essence of digital transformation is data-driven organization, ensuring that key decisions, actions, and processes are strongly influenced by data-driven insights rather than by human intuition. In other words, you will only transform when you have managed to change how people behave and how things are done in your organization. Okay, that's still, that feels quite different from what McKinsey put forth. Um... And you would use a very different measuring stick, I think, to to ascertain how far you are on that journey. Um, but I, I would liken it to products in that products are never done. Digital transformation is never done. Um, and you know, kind of, you know, one of one of my favorite examples of of digital transformation uh, in in a stodgy industry that that many of us are experiencing is in, is in banking. And and I use my mobile app. Uh, partially because it's on my phone, I can show it to people and say, "Hey, look, you know, digital transformation." But um, the the mobile banking functionality has so fundamentally changed my relationship with my bank, and and for many people, it has done that. And this is these are in institutions that are stodgy; they have old ways of thinking, they have a lot of compliance issues, um, and you you really have a hard time imagining them making this leap. And yet, we're seeing that most major players have have crossed that chasm. Um, and have, are delivering uh, mobile experiences that that are shifting their relationship with their clients. Um, and so, what, what's interesting about that is, if you go back to the McKinsey definition, it's interesting to think about that that you're changing the customer experience, but you're also affecting costs. Um, I'm not going to go into a branch for nearly as much banking as I as I used to. So, um, it's a ri- this is a really rich topic, and our our guest has a has a very rich approach to this. Um, and because digital is a component of company strategy, that is no longer a way to compete or to gain a competitive edge, but to survive. Uh, it is it is no longer optional. Um, our guest David Rogers is on the forefront of digital transformation as a topic. He has been for some time. Uh, he is faculty at Columbia Business School and faculty director of executive education programs on digital business strategy and leading digital transformation. David is one of the world's leading experts on digital transformation and the author of five books, including The Digital Transformation Roadmap, Rebuild Your Organization for Continuous Change, which lands in bookstores today. Um, David helped companies around the world transform their business for the digital age, working with senior leaders at corporations such as Google, Microsoft, Citigroup, Visa, HSBC, GE, Toyota, and more. And that 
that list is surprising because it does have some digitally native names on it. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, David is also a member of the faculty at Columbia Business School, where he is faculty director of executive education programs on digital uh, business strategy and on leading digital transformation. He has taught over 25,000 executives through his programs in New York City, Silicon Valley, and online. And we are delighted to have you with us here today. Welcome, David. Thanks so much, Scott. It's a real pleasure to be with you and to be joining the Innovation Engine. Yeah, exciting. Um, well, and, and I'm almost surprised that we haven't had you on before because we we share a, a passion for for this topic. Um, but just just to get us started and to, and to help our listeners um, ground themselves, it as you've noted in some of your talks, I've I've watched some of the things that you've done, and the meaning of the word digital transformation, the phrase digital transformation, yeah. it can can vary greatly. So so why don't you start us off with like. How how would you um, define define this? Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I'm always reminded of years ago after um, my book, the Digital Transformation Playbook, had come out, and I was um, I was speaking in Italy actually, and and the gentleman who introduced me, a Milanese fellow, uh, uh, said, um, "We're so happy to have uh, David Rogers here to talk with us about the digital transformation uh, because everyone is talking about it." Uh, and yet, digital transformation is like an empty suitcase. Um, and I looked at him for a moment and thought what that wondered what that analogy was. And he <laughs> continued and he said, everyone is carrying it around, but no one knows what's inside it. <laughs> I love that. So <laughs> I, I, I really, that stuck with me. And it was sort of underlined for me the point of always trying to say, okay, if whenever I'm in front of an audience or meeting with a company and we're starting to talk about digital transformation, that's very often maybe why I was brought in, to not sort of take it for granted and to say, well, what do we mean by this? Um, and so, yeah, my definition, which I, I lay out explicitly in my latest book so that everyone's on the, on, on the same page, uh, is that digital transformation is transforming an established business uh, to thrive in a world of constant digital change. Hmm. And I would point out there's sort of a, there's three ideas sort of embedded in that uh, definition. Uh, the first is that digital transformation is about the business. It is not about technology, right? Um, too often I see companies who embark on some kind of digital transformation effort and they're defining what they're doing in terms of a bunch of technologies that they expect to deploy. You know, they're right. talking about AI, they're talking about blockchain or robotics or cloud computing or whatever it happens to be. Um, technology, of course, is going to be part of the implementation of whatever strategies you set upon, but that is not the starting point. It really has to be the business, the customers, your employees. Uh, the second point from this definition is that. This is about inherently about established businesses, right? It's not uh, the same thing as how you create a, a new, you know, digital first startup, right? How do you simply uh, scan the environment, look for an unmet customer need, match it up with a uh, maybe a new emerging capability, and you know, search for what my friend Steve Blank would, you know, always calls that a repeatable, scalable, profitable business model. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a startup's job, but. We are talking here about an established organization. You already have a product or products. You have customers. You have a brand reputation. You have partners and distribution channels and uh, go-to-market in place and org charts and processes and compliance departments. All these things are already there. And that is really at the heart of what this challenge is mm -hmm. of digital transformation is that all these things are already in place. And how do you shift? How do you make a change when all these things are already there? Uh, and the third point I would underline from the definition is the digital transformation is a continuous process. It is not a project. It doesn't come with a start date and an end date, right? Um, and that's because the digital revolution is not over. It's not slowing down. There's, there's no plateaus, right? Um, <laughs> it's not like some change happened. Um, and all the companies after that change sort of get it, and all the companies that started before that change are sort of the out-of-date uh, uh, dinosaurs. That's kind of the working model we had in our mind kind of in the early decades of the digital era. Uh, it was kind of these pre-internet uh, companies. They don't get it, and those who are kind of post, you know, mid-90s, post-internet, post-World Wide Web, you know, commercial web, et cetera. Uh, companies, they sort of got it. 
but it turns out that there's no single point in time. This keep we keep having another sort of phase shift every few years. There's this ongoing acceleration of change. That's the real defining characteristic of the digital era. And so it is not about, again, making that one shift or sort of upgrade to your company and okay, we're now a digital business. No, it's mm -hmm. about becoming an organization that is able to keep adapting at the pace of change of the digital era. I think that that definition is so helpful and and sort of correlates to some of the things that we teach here with the product mindset. Products are yeah. never done, you know, continual. Yeah. Like your your users' expectations are changing, your market dynamics are changing. These things are inherent to just doing business digitally, um, and they're not obvious. Um, a lot yeah. of times, a lot of a lot of people want a clear. I'm going to pay you this much money. You're going to get me this much money back. That's how yeah. this works. Yeah. And of yeah. course, it's like, no, I'm going to take you on a journey and hold your hand. Um, very, very different uh, uh, perspective on, on what it is that we're setting, setting about to do. Um, you share you know, in your book a, a formula that I thought was, was really enlightening and, and mm -hmm. helpful um, and, and highlights one of the reasons that digital transformation means so many different things to so many people. You talk about you know, DX, um, where... Uh, D is digital strategy and, and X is organizational change. Mm -hmm. um, and, exactly. And I think that, that a lot of people, you know, skip the strategy part and go to the, the, the and even the organizational part and try to go directly <laughs> to like, you know, that again, technology, right? So go dig, yep. let's just do yep. digital. Um, and yeah. what is, what yeah. is that? Um, so how, how do you guide leaders on how to guard against that, that risk? So that is kind of the whole point of my work from the last, you know, uh, decade or more, um, which uh, in terms of the ideas and the tools and concepts are sort of captured in my last two books. And the first book was the Digital Transformation Playbook, came out seven years ago. That was actually the first book published on the topic explicitly of digital transformation. So I, I lucked out there. My publisher was very happy. I learned the difference between having a good product and having a good product with good timing in the market. <laughs> um, when I wrote that book. And so, you know, it's out yes. in over a dozen languages and took me all over the world. That's but that awesome. was really sort of focused on the strategy side. Mm -hmm. um, and because what I really saw, which I still see today, is lots of companies that were basically being held back what I would call strategic blind spots, right? They were operating by a sort of set of rules of thinking about, you know, the relationship to your customer, thinking about who your competitors are and what are the dynamics of competition, the de very definition of competition, thinking about the role of data within an organization, um, thinking about how we manage innovation and thinking about what is your value proposition? You know, what are you here to sell, so to speak? So this was sort of five core areas of strategy where I saw we had all these kind of tools and ideas, you know, Michael Porter's five forces and the four P's of marketing and all these things that had developed in a very different era, uh, in, in the mass market era, uh, the pre-digital era. And people were just, even people who hadn't read the books or read the articles were just kind of operating with this. This was kind of the unwritten script in the back of your head uh, right. as a business leader. And we needed to say, hey, you are making assumptions that are completely wrong in the digital era about each of these things. So, so I, f I found that to be really critical. Um, and I spent a lot of time working on that and sort of developing really simple ways to think about these five domains and, and, and what's the sort of mindset shift when you think about to sort of effectively do strategy and sort of figure out, you know, what, what's our growth opportunity? What are the needs we should be meeting? How should we think about competing and cooperating with other businesses at the same time and managing those two things in tension? Um, mm -hmm. But what I learned in the years since was that even when companies are able to make that sort of uh, strategic shift in their mindset and really start to imagine and perceive their business differently, that organizations just find it very hard to change. And the more complex they are, and that complexity may be from size, you know, number of employees. It also comes from uh, having multiple lines of business, you know, where you're trying to serve different markets with different needs. Um, and it very much comes from geography, particularly because of you tend to have different regulations and different geographies. So if you're mm. in different geographies, as organizations get more complex, it is harder and harder for them to change or to change quickly. Uh, and so I kept seeing this phenomenon that I sort of thought of in the back of my mind as the stymied CEO, you know, this well-meaning leader who really educates themselves and their team or, or brings the people together to really start thinking differently about, oh, 
our company, you know, our, our legacy media business or automotive company or industrial manufacturer, uh, 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 whatever it is, we need to shift and here's where we need to be going and here's the opportunity. And yet, and they lay out this vision and they say, hey, here's where we're going. This is going to be the big digital, you know, uh, uh, future of the company. And the days and the quarters and the years go by and they're spending money and they say, why is nothing changing? All right. So that became really my focus of the last several years is trying to figure out what are those organizational barriers that are holding it back? Why is it hard for complex organizations to change? And But it's not impossible. What can we learn from those that have solved these problems? What's the through line? What's the common thread? What do they do to get through these very difficult uh, kind of sources of inertia uh, that hold you back? Um, in order to become, as I said, rebuild the organization uh, for continuous change. So that's, to me, critical. You have to have both. Mm -hmm. Well, w one thing that's it's really striking as, as you're talking, and, and this didn't occur to me until just now, but when we're building products, we talk. I, one of the things that I talk about is is how important user research is, and mm. it's in very many, very much the same kinds of things you're talking about. And it's really about aligning the mental model of the team to the mm -hmm. mental model of the customer and the user, which in B2B yeah. software is oftentimes two different people. Right. So you have, you right. have two different people to keep in mind or, or two, two different personas. Lucky if it's only two, you got to deal with, yeah, you know, that, uh, uh, you, purchasing, you can procurement, you got to deal with compliance, you got to deal with the IT overlords, you got to deal with the user. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. You'll be yeah. lucky if there's two, but, um, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but that mental model is really what yeah. you're talking about, right? Like it yeah. is the mental framework that we're working from even a, attuned to spot the opportunities, mm -hmm. the threats and, and the investments yeah. um, that we should be making. It's, that's really, it's really interesting. Um, and I've, I've never thought about it that way. So, you know, in the book, um, which is called the Digital Transformation Roadmap, um, you right. lay out five distinct steps um, for, yep. for that roadmap. And I was wondering if you could go through those with us here. Sure, sure. So the, the first one is to define a shared vision. Um, and this I, I see is really critical and something a lot of companies kind of miss or mm. kind of breeze through, which is it's not enough to say, well, we have to become digital, right? And why? Uh, because Netflix, Blockbuster, Kodak, you know, the sort of the classic, you know, you point to some cases of kind of industry disruption. Uh, the world is changing because chat GPT, you know, uh, you rattle off sort of, sort of some sort of obvious macro uh, uh trends in the environment, that's not enough, right? What you need is a vision that is unique to your organization. Mm -hmm. And that needs to combine both an understanding of how is your world changing, right? Maybe you are a mid-sized professional services firm in Southeast Asia. Maybe you are, you know, an industrial, uh, uh, you know, an energy extraction firm in, in South America. Maybe you're a Canadian uh you know, tech companies serving small businesses uh, in your sphere, your customers, your environment. How is that world changing, right? Not the sort of the world at large, but for you specifically, what is your opportunity? Where do you need to go as a business or what position do you aim to sort of uh, uh, stake out or hold where you're going to play a unique role and why you, right? What's your right to win? Why are you the ones who should be there, who are going to be mm -hmm. able to do that better than uh, any other organization? So it's, it's a much more specific sort of vision of the future and where you're going. Um, and it has to be shared. That's the other thing. I, 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 <laughs> it's very common. I'll be talking to a CEO and, you know, off the record, just one on one, they'll say, uh, yeah, to be honest, if if you ask three people in my company what our digital transformation is trying to do, you get three totally different answers. Like, mm -hmm. There's not a kind of a common understanding of what, what this is about. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first step. Right. And, and I have some sort of, you know, what I've seen kind of the most critical ingredients of a shared vision uh, that, that, that companies who do this right sort of always kind of pull together. Um, the second is you have to, second step is to pick the problems that matter most. Hmm. Right. And this is where I see a lot of companies failing to have that kind of discipline around strategy and saying, what are we going to do before all else? Right. And you have to be willing to say no to lots of different interesting digital opportunities in order to say yes to the few of them that really are the most important to your business at this point in time. Yeah. Um, the third step is uh, validating new ventures, learning how to bring the methodologies of 
exactly what you were talking about, you know, iterative uh, product development, experimentation, uh, customer uh, discovery, et cetera. Uh, these iterative processes of learning, continuously sort of learning and building uh, as you go in an incremental fashion, rather than the traditional model in almost every large organization of planning, planning, and more planning, mm -hmm. uh, which comes from a history. There's historical reasons why those management processes evolved, but they are no longer a good match for the environment we are in now. They maximize control uh, 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 over, over sort of, you know, knowable risks, but they minimize uh, flexibility, adaptability, and speed. And that right. trade-off is just the wrong trade-off today. So it's learning well, to, to, to make that shift. Sorry, go ahead. If I can, well, I just wanted yeah. to comment on that really quickly, because yeah. I think one of the things that I've learned in the trenches of trying to help companies do this, and, and I haven't been uh, doing digital transformation at the leadership level, but at the at the the line level of trying to create digital products, digital services, yeah. and experiences, and there you tend to see you know people will talk about ROI and they want to see a business case uh, for yeah. a feature right. or whatever, and of course it's all based on speculation and I mean it winds up being business theater. And at the end of the day, yeah. I'm going to find out what this is truly going to cost and what this is truly going to yeah. um, deliver in terms of value as I go. And yeah. the best thing you can do is empower me to make micro choices as yeah. I pursue this so that and I'm reading really and reacting. For organizations <laughs> to make that shift, they don't understand that. So, I mean, I have a tool within that chapter of the book where I call it, which I call the four stages of validation. And it's just about showing that there's a sequence. There's a, there's an order to these questions. Yes, of course you need to, one of the questions you have to validate is what's the, what's the profit margin going to be? What's the total addressable market? What's the size of the opportunity? What's, you know, what's the financial outcome that we're aiming for? Mm -hmm. But you cannot start with that. Right. It, that, there's a reason why that's the fourth stage. <laughs> you, start with that, <laughs> right. you don't know yet uh, uh, what the customer would use. You don't know what the solution is. You don't even know what problem you're solving. Right. You think you know right. all these things, but you haven't validated any of them. So you're just filling in a whole bunch of imagined numbers and then you're adding them up on. And at the bottom of the Excel sheet, you say, hey, here's our margin. Well, it doesn't mean <laughs> anything. So, yeah, you have to develop these that kind way. of, yeah, of course, you, we, we'd love to, it would be much simpler, mm -hmm. but that's why we have to have to work iteratively because there's so much more uncertainty. So, so that's a, that's a big one. That's the third, the third mm -hmm. step. Then the fourth step is how do you take that? What we we're just talking about, Scott, and how do you do that? Not in a team. And of course, you know, you know this because working with established businesses, how do you do it repeatedly? How do you do it in multiple teams across an organization, allocating resources across different strategic opportunities with knowing that many of them are not going to pan out? And so you have to have a very different kind of management, what I would call governance model mm. of people, resources, and metrics, right? Um, and so that's that's the fourth stage. And, and doing that at scale, I call it managing growth at scale, right? Uh, and then lastly, the fifth step is uh, about capabilities. And so I call it growing technology, talent, and culture. And the point here is each of these, these steps are in a certain order for a reason, right? Having that shared vision of where you're trying to go as a company will feed into and inform your thinking about what are the problems that matter most. As you start to identify some problems, now you're in a position to start validating potential solutions, right? Otherwise, you've got teams that are just kind of shooting off in all directions on Innovation Island, and everybody's got a zillion ideas, right? So that yeah. has to follow. And once you've got some teams that are learning how to actually uh, iterate and, and innovate in an iterative fashion, then you've got to say like, okay, how do we do this at scale and, 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 and balance these and manage these as a portfolio and like a pipeline of ideas. Then you're in the position to start saying, okay, where are biggest gaps in our current technology infrastructure, right? Maybe we've got an mm -hmm. old legacy, uh, inflexible uh, um, uh, ERP system that's holding us back, or we've got commonly a whole mess of different, you know, 150 different applications running our, our banking system as a bank, you know, in, in the background trying to talk to each other. What mm -hmm. are the talent gaps we face that are biggest, right? And what are the culture gaps or the, the culture misalignment with what we need to be doing that are most severe for us? And then you can start to address these. You, you can't, so again, like the finance question, you can't start from the back end. Lots of companies try to come in and say, hey, we're going to sell, we're going to help you upgrade your whole technology infrastructure. And once you do that, hey, the world's going to be your oyster and you're going to find all these new business models and blah, blah, blah. There's no generic digital 
like staff. There's no generic talent set. There's no generic culture that we all need to have. So you have to sort of start down this road before you can start making those uh, um, investments. But, but the last point I want to make is it is not, although there's a sequence, this is not a stage gate. Right? This is cyclical, mm. right? Okay. It's not you're done with, you come up with a vision and great, we're done with that. And then we'll pick our problems. Okay, that's done. Just put them on the shelf. Everybody knows what they are. This whole process, and you should really go through the five steps, you know, I would argue in your first 90 days, hmm. and then you keep repeating it, right? And, and mm -hmm. basically every idea in this book is an iterative process, right? Each thing is feeding into the next, and then you go back and you repeat the loop because you do not do organizational change, big bang, top down, hey, we're revamping the whole company and blah, 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 and everything's going to be done. I, and we've seen company after company try this with agile and with other big giant project approaches. Uh -huh. And it's a record of, of failure. Organizational change, I have learned, has to be done iteratively. And you learn as you go and you adapt it as you go and you take the ideas and figure out how it's going to actually work for you as you go. Mm. Well, you know, and, and, and that's, again, I'm drawing these interesting parallels to building products in terms of agile as we, as we yeah. talk about it. And I think a lot of people misunderstand agile. It's meant, yeah. it's not not planning, it's planning all the time. Yeah, but it yeah. but it builds in certain point uh, ritualized moments where we get to replan. Yeah, um, and and, and, we're and you don't in do that, that ritual. ritual once every year or two. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's you, about a much shorter cycle. Much shorter, you know, yeah. two weeks yeah. to a month. No, no yeah. longer yeah. than that. And yeah. that's yeah. because as we get new information, yeah. and I used yeah. to say this as a product manager, if I discover that a feature is going to cost twice as much as I thought it was going to cost yeah. when they first sized it, I have to reevaluate whether or not it's worth it. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's exactly. that's a logical thing to do. That's what you want yeah. your people doing at the at the ground level. But but I'm not supposed to be interrupting the sprint. Um, I'm supposed to let the yeah. work go, get the, gather the learnings, and then we replant. So we're 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 habitually uh, building in change management. Um, yeah, and, and ritualizing yeah. it. So that's a it's just that's interesting. I've never seen it's, the parallels it's, quite so it's starkly. The same kind of mindset to organizational change. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. We're bringing it over to this. Absolutely. So, so in the chapter on DX and the, and the challenge of innovation, you write about the importance of companies figuring out how to thrive beyond their core um, and, and what, they, yeah. what they currently define as their core. Amazon's a great mm -hmm. example um, because they've proven that they can, they can reinvent themselves over and over again. Can, can you touch on a few examples of how Amazon has been able to thrive beyond their core? And, and I'm even interested to hear how you define their core and what lessons uh, li listeners can take away from the Amazon example. Yeah, I, I mean, Amazon is certainly a great example of this. I mean, this is one of the hardest things for companies. Um, you know, I always say that when you talk about innovation in an established business, as opposed to, you know, a, a, a blank slate startup, one of the two fundamental problems you face is that every incumbent is designed and managed for the primary goal of optimizing their current business model. Right. Uh -huh. um, and what that means is there is always going to be an organizational bias against ideas that go beyond the current uh, core business, that extend beyond that. Um, and what tends to happen is if you have good companies that are able to come up with some good products, they're going to have good people there. They're going to be smart. They're going to come up with interesting ideas. They're going to look at the market. So it's not that these companies don't actually come up with ideas beyond the core. It's that they keep failing to bring them to market, right? And mm. we see so many examples of this. I mean, you know, one of the more recent ones of note was Cisco, which was already, you know, very much in the uh, video conferencing market um, uh, with WebEx was their, was their big product at the time when one of their own employees came up with an idea for a product that would be uh, a little simpler interface, more sort of designed as a consumer, you know, sort of could be, you know, prosumer, either consumer or business uh, application. Uh, this was Eric Yuan, and he had this idea for what, uh, what would become Zoom. And, you know, from the outside, it sounds like pretty, you know, oh, but it's a close, you know, extension to what you're currently doing. But that was too far from the core, right? Cisco is very defined by its its kind of sales uh, uh, force and, and sales process and enterprise, you know, uh, go-to market strategy. And they said, ah, oh, this isn't really what we do. 
So he just couldn't get people to support it right, uh, mm -hmm. within Cisco. So eventually he left and launched Zoom. And of course, then you know, COVID hit and, and Zoom became a verb and nobody even Zoom remembers, Zoom. you know, WebEx. <laughs> um, right. But IBM, Xerox, Park, you know, just history of, of technology is sort of littered with examples of this. So it, mm -hmm. it, is, it is really hard. Uh, is the first thing that I would I would point out. Uh, so I think it's too a little easy to sort of say, "Wow, Amazon's amazing, right?" And, and certainly, Amazon is a great example. It's, it's hard to come up with a better or sort of more impressive example of a company launching, uh, developing, you know, established, well-established business, uh, 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 pursuing a new opportunity that's really quite far from the core, and being able to take it from that sort of little seed idea and nurture it and grow up to be something really, you know, significant, very significant to the business. Uh, it's harder to come up with a better idea, example than Amazon Web Services. Because hmm. remember when AWS started, it was not, you know, Amazon's core was certainly at that point, uh, very, very clearly uh, uh, e-commerce, retail. They were a retail business. Hmm. Um, and their customers were, you know, consumer, you know, retail shoppers. Um, the whole business was built around that. And here comes this idea, and not from the S team, not from the echelons, from a junior network engineer named Benjamin Black, and he kind of sketched out on a little white paper. He was one of several different people who were all kind of looking at, uh, working on the, the issue of how do, we, how do we redesign the IT infrastructure for Amazon? Because they had a monolithic architecture at the time. Uh, oh. Everybody associates modular architecture with Amazon, but that's because yeah. of what came next. That's so they so had interesting. this classic kind of monolithic app that was everything. It was built to sell books. And now it was supposed to be like selling ebooks and streaming videos <laughs> and you know all this stuff. And it was just like a mess. And it was getting really slow to make every single change. Hmm. And so they said, you know, we've got to build this whole thing over again to be uh, uh, easier to update and also more resilient and, and, and you know, uh, elastic in terms of scaling with demand and, and fluctuation and so forth. So they had these technical requirements and lots of people were working on it and kind of, you know, moving towards this idea of a modular architecture. But one of the people who was sort of sketching out, okay, which of these kind of approaches that were out there should we kind of put together for, for our stack? was Ben Black, and he sort of took some of the ideas that others were talking about. But then he added this last page on his, his memo where he said, if we do this right, you know, maybe we could sell this as a service to other companies, because this would be like a great, um, you know, as, you know as, as a service, you know, um, uh, you know inf infrastructure. Um, and his boss, a guy named Chris Pinkham said, oh, that's kind of an interesting idea. Let's, let's revise, let's polish this up a little bit more. And then Send the uh, send this uh, send this up to the top. See if anybody wants to take a look at it. And Bezos, you know, caught his eye and he said, you know, this is interesting. He sent Chris Pinkham uh, off to South Africa, right, <laughs> about as far from hmm. uh, from uh, uh, Seattle as you could go. This is one of the principles of how you do this: is you've got to uh, you've got to have separation uh, uh, by and large. Hmm. So he sends a team of Chris and a couple engineers to South Africa to work on one of the first. Um, uh, he was one of a couple teams who were working on the first two or three prod products. I think that one might have been EC2, one uh -huh. of the products that they launched AWS with. And, you know, they nurtured it through this idea and they, they built it. This was way, this is a, a different, totally different customer. This is selling to enterprises. So uh -huh. totally different partner ecosystem would be required. Different customers, different go-to-market, different pricing. Everything is different from the core business. So... Here's why these things are hard. You don't have a place for them in your organizational structure. The metrics you have in your company that are already established are built for the current core business and are a mismatch for this new idea. Hmm. Your resources, who, who, who gives resources to this, right? Typically, in most organizations, uh, uh, those who create resources own resources, right? Those are the mm -hmm. business units that are generating revenue and profit. They're the ones who sort of have resources to allocate customer focus, right? There's this inherent tension uh, that, you know, Clay Christensen identified. Companies tend to fail to invest in, uh, you know, innovations that might disrupt themselves in, in that sort of classic uh, uh, outside in a uh, new market model of, of disruption. Mm -hmm. um, that they, they fail to do that because their own customers don't care about it, right? So customer focus, of course, is critical. But sometimes if you're only focused on your current customers, then you will not pay attention to these ideas. Sometimes there's cannibalization. That's it depends on what the idea is. There might be a risk or perceived risk that becomes another barrier. The biggest barrier, though, is just what Ted Levitt 
uh, I wrote about years ago and talked about is marketing myopia. You know, over time, mm -hmm. successful companies define themselves by the products that they have made rather than by the needs that their customers have today. Mm -hmm. So there's all these things that make it hard. That's why so many companies struggle with it, but it can be done. And, you know, uh, Amazon's not the only one. Of course, they built AWS to be the most profitable part of the whole company, right? Uh, and that's kind of why they be, have, have grown to be the company that they are today. But uh -huh. I see other companies too, non sort of digital native companies, New York Times, part of why they've really been able to turn around uh, their financial footing uh, is because they're not just transforming the news report, you know, the kind of core product. They're building all these sort of side businesses, games and cooking and uh, the athletic and so forth, mm. wire cutter, all these others. Those are separate paid subscriptions, or you can mm. get them now in a bundle. MasterCard's another example of a company I've seen doing this, moving far beyond uh, their credit card network and investing in really important, interesting new opportunities. Walmart, they're not just doing e-commerce and, and, and physical commerce. You know, they're, they're moving into health and financial services. So companies can do this. You just mm -hmm. have to manage it very differently. Yeah. Well, and, and one story that I remember from Amazon that it, that struck me um, was the he had put someone in, in charge of the, the Amazon phone, which we don't talk about anymore because mm -hmm. it, it, it spectacularly failed. Oh, I talk about it. I got a whole <laughs> section on it in the book. And oh, it's great. to show, look, it's not just these these old fogies from the old companies who can make the mistake of uh, insufficient humility and assume that they know uh, uh that they know the business model and know what the market response is and that they sort of all these things you think you know and really they're just sort of assumptions so uh -huh. yes even even the mighty can fall into that trap is kind of what they try to show no one, in that story no one is human is is immune from hubris um yes exactly <laughs> but uh but it was it was really interesting the 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 follow-on part where you know this this executive was explaining how he's apologizing to jeff for the spectacular failure of the amazon phone and, mm -hmm. and wasted resources and and jeff was like are you not paying attention? Yeah. It is only because of that, that failure and that, that experiment that we now have Alexa mm. and the entire Echo ecosystem. Um, and that was an offshoot, I guess, a downstream offshoot, a downstream idea that came out of the, the work that was done for the phone. But um, Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it came out of the, the willingness to allocate resources. They were actually started in parallel. I, I think it's a little revisionist history to say, I don't think the technology of Alexa actually benefited from the Fire Phone, but, but, hmm. but it is true that, 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 you know, you have to give Amazon credit that they, even in that, as they were making that mistake, they were also betting big on some other ideas that they, they did manage to bring to market like Alexa correctly. I mean, the Fire Phone was mm -hmm. mishandled and Bezos owes, owes, owns the, the fault really more than anyone that the record's pretty clear. But I think he learned from that and he, he didn't take such a hands-on like, hey, I love this idea. Here's, I'm going to kind of shepherd it along. Really, you don't want the CEO doing that. Oh my God, that's just, mm -hmm. of course that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, I think he learned the lesson. <laughs> it's like, well, and, push and the if, teams, but don't take too much of a personal kind of uh, emotional uh, uh, investment in the idea that it's going to be just how you dreamed it. That's right. That's right. Well, and I think that that bit of humility right there is is key, I think, to successfully yeah. doing these experiments and also pulling the plug when it's time to. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it was a failure. You learn something yeah. really important in that. And oh, that, yeah. le that learning yeah. can be more valuable than the, the product. Um, yeah. I, I often say if I can. If I can learn something about my users they don't know about themselves, I can turn that into lots of products. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so re whether, whether this particular feature succeeds or not doesn't mean we're, we're left with nothing. Um, but the only crime in, in, in digital is not learning. Uh, that, that to me is... A uh, well, there's two crimes. One is not learning from your mistakes. And the other is, you know, spending $300 million to learn something that you could have learned for $30,000. Right. <laughs> well, well said. And that actually takes me into my next question. Um, <laughs> as, as you say that, um, so you, you write about the, the failure of CNN plus, um, yeah. CNN plus, sorry, I'll make sure I yes. see that right. as a case study for how to not manage digital transformation. So since you already started to, uh, kind of alluding to it there, yeah. um, why don't you take us through that a little bit? That's a great story. Sure. So CNN plus was, was, you know, that, that was the mistake that they made. Um, so this was a company that so so there's as I, I mentioned, there's kind of two fundamental challenges, reasons why innovation is so hard in established businesses. So the first one I we already talked about, 
that's because there's all these kind of inherent biases against ideas that are uh, a bit farther from your core business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the other is this problem of uncertainty. So I call that first one the problem of proximity. Like as it becomes less and less proximate to your core, uh, it becomes harder and harder to sort of effectively go after those ideas. It's not at all impossible, just harder. Um, and then the second is the problem of uncertainty. And mm. this is, there's been a lot of great sort of uh, thinking and, and, and research and insights on, on this issue and innovation in the last kind of 10, 20 years. But, you know, the fundamental problem is we assume uh, uh, what we are hypothesizing, hypothesizing, right? We sort of sketch out a vision of an idea. And the more we sort of talk about it, we think we're actually describing facts rather than hypotheses. Yes. Um, and the reason why we wind up doing this is because of how we manage our companies. And so CNN is sort of a great example of what I call, uh, you know, the four stages of planning, which is, you know, you start by gathering a lot of data. And the second is you, you sort of, uh, 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 plan out what you see as the scenarios of what's going to happen if you take a certain course of action. Uh, classic, you know, so the first case part is all about, you know, benchmarking and third party data and getting, you know, your consultants to come in and bring you kind of all sorts of market research and so forth. Not, not actual research that you are directly doing. This is a very right. important distinction, not right. actual tests, but sort of existing kind of third party data. Then you do this business case writing. So you write all these kind of scenarios and analysis. There's all this analysis in the second stage. Uh, and then the third stage is the decision, the expert decision. So somebody at the top, somebody who, who is thought to know the most or have the most experience or seniority makes the call. They say, well, we've got the data. We've done the analysis. You know, do we, is it go or no go or which door do we go through? They make the pick. And then step four is execution. So once that decision has been made, you say, well, best chance of success, we got to go all in. And so you pile in all these resources right, to go after this idea. This is classically how large organizations operate. And it absolutely fails in environments of uncertainty. So CNN, they saw a really interesting strategic opportunity, which is to say, hey, maybe we should go into streaming. Um, and because they saw the whole world was, this was, you know, uh, post pandemic or coming out of the pandemic and they saw the whole world was kind of heading in this direction. Um, they saw not just the, you know, early streaming first, uh, you know, players, the, 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 the Netflix and Hulu's and, and equivalents around the world, but they saw how even, you know, Disney had gotten in, how, uh, uh, you know, Warner brothers, their parent company had, you know, HBO had gone, had gone into, to, to streaming and so forth. And so they said, Hey, maybe you could do streaming for news, right? Could a news brand have a paid streaming service. Now, first of all, I'll say that's a very strategically relevant question for them. It's a really interesting opportunity to pursue. Um, it's a great hypothesis. So it's not like, oh, these guys are smoking crack or weirdly come up with these ideas or they don't know their customers or something <laughs> like that, right? right? It's a good, you know, great thing to explore. But then they followed the old playbook, right? So they hired, you know, a large consulting firm. You can look up who it was. Um, and they brought in all kinds of data saying, oh, look at how the market is exploding uh, and streaming. And then they came up with these projections and they said, you're going to have, you know, these million users in your first year. And by you know, year four, you're going to have, have gone international. You'll have 24 million users or something. It's this is like your, your this, and this is all spelled out as very conservative estimates because obviously still it's much lower than what Disney and these other folks have done. Um, and so they laid out the analysis and then the top executives. This was Jeff Zucker uh, at CNN made the decision and with the full backing of Jason Keillor of Warner Brothers, who was uh, above him. And they said, oh, this is going to be the future of news. This is going to be as big as cable and the first, you know, uh, uh, first shift to doing 24 hour, you know, news coverage. Uh, it's going to transform everything. This is the future. You know, they saw it. So we're going to do it. So they spent $300 million before day one. That was all just getting ready to launch the very first uh, iteration of the project on day one, you know, getting like top flight, you know, talent and putting all together, all these shows. Oh, by the way, they couldn't use any of their existing material, right? Hmm. Interesting challenge, right? Because of contractual uh, agreements with their, their cable channels, they couldn't use any of the content that was airing on CNN. I did uh, not know cable. that. That's crazy. So, yeah, so there's a lot of kind of interesting opportunity here and a lot of serious business questions. Like, who's the customer going to be, right? Is the customer going to be people who currently watch CNN? Is it going to be people who don't watch CNN, but now this is what they wanted? Uh, you know, 
they seemed to have the idea that that uh, that the current CNA customer was going to be certainly their first way. That was going to be their their bread and butter customer, and then they were going to expand out from there. So I'm sorry, but it would not be very hard. It would not take a lot of time, and certainly would not take three hundred million dollars to run some tests and get some pretty good first party data on what percent of your current television customers um, are interested would would be willing to even try out. Uh, a paid service, you know, and these all free, you know, they always launch with a free trial, but, you know, to sign up, put the credit card down and say, yeah, I'll try it for 30 days free. Apparently no such test was run, right? They launched mm. the service and they had about 1% of their current customers. Uh, that was the number of, of how many people signed up in wow. those first days. Whole thing was shut down in 30 days, uh, in a month, basically. Um, so, it was a debacle, but it was because they went about the whole thing by the old playbook. Uh, the idea was absolutely worth pursuing. Uh, there were lots of interesting business questions in there. Like Alexa, it could have been that they started with that idea and they ran some tests and they would have discovered, oh, this is not going to work right now. <laughs> not probably, but they might have found some things that could have led to another opportunity that would have been really interesting for them. But they did the old planning, planning, planning playbook. And they threw this, this mountain of resources at it, thinking that that's what you do. Hmm. Um, but it's not what you do. What you do is two things. One, you have to do experimentation, right? As we've talked about, which in a sense, that's what startups do, right? Small teams iteratively testing, validating the ideas really fast, really cheap, moving quickly. And second, you have to pair that with iterative funding, which is what hmm. you know, venture capital does. You don't give $300 million. Again, you give a, the littlest bit you can at the very first stage and say, go out. And, and answer one question. There's uh -huh. a question I want you to answer in your first sprint with this little piddling amount of money and then come back to me. And then we'll discuss uh, what the next question to answer is. And after we've answered maybe a few questions, if they're all unpromising responses, we might say, okay, we've learned a lot. Let's wrap this up. It's been you know, six months and, and $100,000 and we're done. Uh, but you, you, it's a totally different approach. It's it's frightening though, even at startups. Um, and I and I, I have to believe that this has roots in, and you, you've said it several times, but this traditional idea of how business cases get funded, even how businesses yeah. get funded, um, yeah. right? The, the traditional way that business schools taught business cases was exactly this approach. And yeah. the only thing missing now is money. So give me a dollop mm -hmm. of cash, and I'll go out and 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 make you all this money and capture this yeah. much of the market. And, and it's just not it's not like that. There's all the hidden obstacles. There's all the the insights that you haven't gotten yet. And so that, that's why I always come back to, for me, the only, the, the biggest crime is not learning something. I can handle failure. I can't handle not, not turning that failure into it, into we, there's something yeah, we missed. But, you, got us you, there. but the, to do it, especially to do it, not as one team, but to do it at scale in a company, you mm. need to have processes for how do you go about in a structured fashion, uh, identifying your hypotheses and going out and testing them. Right, because mm -hmm. any good idea, if you're really humble and you really understand the uncertainty behind it, has got like a hundred questions right off the bat. Right. You can't go test all of them. So yep. that that's what I learned. I saw so many teams when they actually got the mindset shift right. The process problem they had was where do we start? Or what do I do first? Mm -hmm. and it just got overwhelming. So again, that's why I have this sort of this sequence mo sequencing model called the four stages of validation, mm -hmm. um, which I just developed working with lots of teams, independent as well as within big companies. And and the other thing is you got to have this process for funding. So yeah. you, you if you don't have the governance model around resource allocation across a portfolio of ideas, again, you can say, oh, we want to learn. We're willing to embrace having some things that won't work out. And uh, and we understand uh, uh, the importance of, of embracing uncertainty and so forth. But if you don't actually have those processes in place in a way that they can scale, you are not going to get the payoff in an established business. Now, that that makes a ton of a ton of sense, and it's actually interesting. We're trying to help a few companies now put in place those stage gates because mm. they're used to being, you know, send this case to the the founder of the company. He will decide <laughs> yeah. if we're going to fund yeah. it. And yeah. now we're now we're dealing That's with a product that does single sponsor model, which is uh, just terrible. It's, 
Yeah. And, and, and he fully funds it on the spot. Yeah. He's like, I love yeah. this presentation. It's great. Like, I, I, I'm and in. Now he loved it. <laughs> Who's going to come back in 30 days and say, yeah, actually, that was a, t- turns out that was a bad idea. That's right. The, the sponsor, the founder just said he loves the idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know? that's, that's, you got to make right. it work, right? Well, and, and I'm working with a director of product who's like, I'm tired of babysitting these bad products. Like, yeah. how, do I, how do I get some stage gates in? I was like, yeah. oh, I can help you with that. Um, it's demoralizing. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. really frustrating. Nothing yeah. worse than, than knowing you're working on a, on a bad bad product or bad yeah, solution. Exactly. Like, wait, this, this is not my job. Just going to keep hiding it. And, <laughs> Babysit you know. failure? Like, this is not yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, guys, let me jump in real quick. We're running short on time. I think we probably have time for one more and then the speed round. Okay. Uh, David, do you I don't want know to if do there's that? any particular one that you want us to feed you? Um, six, seven, eight, or nine? You know... I mean, seven problem opportunities, eight is good. Does the team structure, I, I, I don't know. I would, I would kind of say, you know, maybe eight or, or, or nine, but uh, I, I would skip six. I mean, it's a good question, but I, I think I yeah. just to sort of follow along the line of what we've been doing. Mm-hmm. I would kind of say maybe seven, eight or nine. All right, Scott, you get to pick. I get to pick. All right. Eight or nine, because we've, we've talked Amazon enough already <laughs> to do eight or nine, whichever one. I would do eight or nine. Seven's a, a little long. It's going to be a little longer for me to answer, I guess, is my right, point. Right. Well, let's do nine because uh, everyone loves okay. a good story. So let's, yeah. let's, uh, let's do that. All right. All right. So yeah, that, that's, that's really great. And that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. And so kind of to, to help land this for our listeners a little bit, uh, there are so many great anecdotes sprinkled throughout the book about companies who've undergone these successful digital transformations, which I, I have to believe are rarer than they should be. Um, hmm. But household names like New York Times, Walmart, which you, men- uh, you mentioned New York Times earlier, um, and less well-known companies like Optimizely and Hire. Um, yeah. I'm sure it's a, a difficult, you know, qu- question to answer. But w- mm-hmm. what would be your what, what's what's your what's your party favorite um, story to tell? Oh, uh, gosh, you know, <laughs> what's you know what's your favorite child? Um, <laughs> That's right. I mean, my f- sometimes depends on my mood. Sometimes my favorite is like CNN. It's like the the, the crash and burn flames. That's, That's right. The but, failure story. Yeah. No. No. The sort of the 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 success stories. I mean, uh, one that's close to my heart, partly because it's not that is well known, and partly because I had a very you know a re- great collaborative relationship working with this company and their leadership was is Acuity Insurance. So that's a regional insurer, mm-hmm. sort of a you know mid level mm-hmm. insurance company operating in. Uh, several different states in the U.S., but they're not one of the you know top tier wine companies, um, and they've really done an amazing job of being one of the and you know rightly uh, 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 acclaimed and, and awards and so forth for being one of the most digitally innovative and fastest moving uh, companies in the business. Um, and it's such a fascinating industry, insurance, to understand sort of how tricky it is to get right. And, and there's a real gap between the companies like Lemonade that come in and draw in a lot of venture capital with a great story about something that sounds amazing as a, like a selling a consumer experience, but is probably a, a terrible business model. Uh, it starts to become true over visible over time. Annuity doesn't, Acuity doesn't have that luxury like any, you know, established, but especially a business that doesn't have access to sort of large capital markets uh, and just an established business in the company, in the industry. So they have to be very sort of rigorous about figuring out, you know, what are the strategic problems that matter most. And so I got a chance right. to work with their CEO and his top team. He, which is a little atypical, came from a sort of a CIO role uh, into a CEO role. Right. Uh, but despite that, not at all a technology first, very much a, you know, focused on culture, focused on the customer, focused on what's the strategic opportunity, focused on what's the business model. So really the kind of right mindset, uh, looking at the organization, looking at culture change from the bottom up and looking really strategically at some really fascinating, great opportunities, not easy ones, but tricky and really interesting opportunities in terms of where both um, uh, commercial lines and uh, um, personal lines of insurance. This isn't property and casualty uh, uh, classification of insurance. You know, where they are going in the digital era. What are the interesting unknowns around things like what's going to happen to risk around automobiles as we may not get to full uh, autonomy, but as we're getting more and more sort of semi-autonomous driving, and you know, as risk pools shrink in one area and then emerge in others, how does that change your business? Mm. Just such a fun team to work with. 
people just open to ideas, not at all full of themselves. So mm. that was just an amazing culture and a company that there's just so many interesting things that they've built and are building and, and really taking that kind of long, long view strategically. Um, I, I do I, I do love the New York Times case as a teaching case because the thing I like about that is whenever I deal with a company and I and I talk about these barriers to digital transformation and all the things companies do wrong and and they just keep nodding their head and they're like, oh my God, we do that. Oh my God, we do that. Or they say, <laughs> oh shoot, we've been doing this for three years and the whole thing started with a technology roadmap and I realize now this has been kind of completely backwards. Uh -huh. You know, whatever it is. And then they sort of say to me with this despair in their eyes, is there any hope for us? <laughs> right. I say, yes, remember the New York Times. Right. Today, people love to point to the Times as like a sort of a acknowledged example of digital transformation. You know, such mm -hmm. an old, they're practically 200 years old at this point, you know, legacy business steeped in like tradition and old fashioned thinking and so forth. And they've really mm -hmm. transformed the business model. They changed the culture. They're, they've done so much, you know, been extremely innovative, pioneering, da, 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 all this stuff. Guess what? The New York Times in its first decade of digital transformation made every single mistake in the book. It was uh, a complete failure. It is the best learning example of everything not to do. Uh, <laughs> and so the point is, you know, when I see these surveys that say, oh, 70% of digital transformations fail, I say, well, no, 70% of companies who are trying to transform to do a digital transformation are failing so far or have mm. not gotten, <laughs> gotten success or any results yet, right? But if you look at those who are, who are in that you know, esteemed 30%, which is a lot of companies we can learn from by now, look a little bit back in their history. Mm. I guarantee all of them did some kind of basic fundamental mistakes, like Jeff Bezos falling in love with the Fire Phone, you know, at yep. some point in their history. And, you know, the New York Times did them all. So if they can make every single mistake in the book and then turn it around, uh, with a real sort of sea change in, in, in defining like, oh my gosh, what do we really need to do here? And kind of resetting the whole mindset of the company and then really changing the whole organization, then, then your business can too, right? Any company can I do it that. if they focus on really doing it right. You know, I, I love that. And that, you know, just personally for me, I worked at a, um, a Fortune 100 publisher, textbook publisher yeah. mostly, but, um, and, uh, and I worked in identity and access management. So firmly mm -hmm. digital inside yeah. of this publishing company, publishing leaders, um, lots of interesting fiefdoms inside the company, yeah. from acquisitions, you know, relationships, yeah. very, very tribal. And, and it really was the digital strategy that, that forced them to try to break up those relationships and those, um, and it was, it was just really interesting to watch senior leadership try to break down the core of the business so yeah. that we could go digital, yeah. um, because we just were so stuck on, on, you know, printing books. Um, yeah. but you know, Hey, it's like, this is not, this is not going to last forever. So we need yeah. to use this yeah. money to make the right investments <laughs> to go digital. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was just so fascinating watching the set of things that leadership was willing to do the mistakes that were made, the, the yeah. investments that went right, the ones that went wrong, the ones that went wrong and then turned right. That, that's yeah. the other interesting thing that like, like watching leaders learn from some missteps um, and then course correct. And th uh, those were some of the most test of leadership. Moments. Right. Yeah. You're, it, you're never not going to have missteps. It's how, how do you respond to them and how, how well and how quickly do you? Yeah. 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 But it's a, it's a ride. Yeah. <laughs> That's for yeah. sure. Uh, not, not for the weak of heart. Um, no, no, it's pretty interesting. Well, this is, this is great. And, and again, this is a, a topic that we, we spent a lot of time thinking about and, uh, and I'm really glad that we got a chance to have you on here, uh, to, yeah. to introduce some of your ideas and thinking and frameworks. I think these are really helpful, um, yeah. and, and, uh, and motivating hopefully for, for those who are on this journey and scared yeah. they're on the wrong path, uh, as well as those that are looking to start it or, um, or what have you. But um, to close out, I'd love to do a, a little speed round with you, if you don't mind. Terrific. Sure. Awesome. Um, game. So the book is dedicated to Karen, my beloved partner in creative mucking around. Mm. I, I have to ask. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so we, we do know that Karen is your wife. That's um, right. I, I hope that's the one in the same, Karen. Yes. Um, yes. So what kind of creative mucking around are we talking about in the Rogers household? <laughs> You know, it depends. The original, the origin of that phrase was about uh, creative mucking around in the kitchen. 
Um, mm. This goes back to a personals ad, which brought us together uh, years ago. And um, <laughs> that's great. And the point was just like having fun and like trying stuff. And like neither of us, the point was, was someone who was like into like going out for fine dining or, 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 or like putting on a really impressive meal to sort of show your friends. It was just like, yeah, let's get in there and like play around with stuff and try cooking. And there've been a lot of other projects since then. Uh, but you know, I, I'm so blessed in the book is as well, because, you know, Karen's not just the smartest person I know. She's also the best editor I know. So mm. all my books, she's the one who gets it when it's, um, almost finished and it is such a great, cause it's not her field, but she has such a keen mind. It's that's the conversation where we really kind of break everything open and say like, okay, what does this really mean? And why is this here? And how does this idea relate to that? And, uh, yeah, so mm. that's, that's our, our you know, we, we just finished that, uh, at the start of the year with this book. So that's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I, I'm, yeah. I'm a little bit jealous. I don't think I could get my wife to read anything I write. So, <laughs> uh, so I think that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, are there, uh, in, along the same lines, are there writers or thinkers in the space that you find yourself turning to, or even personally swapping, swapping ideas with? I'm curious. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, people I know and swap ideas and have learned so much from, um, you know, I would say, have to say, you know, Steve Blank, mm -hmm. um, also his, uh, his co-author from Startup Owners Manual, Bob Dorf, um, just learned so much from both, both of them about uh, customer development, about uh, um, building ideas, about learning iteratively in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of became my window into, to really understanding how like, you know, product management and design thinking and, and agile and everything. They're all kind of different sides of the same, uh, I don't know, tetrahedron um, and, <laughs> and kind of how they all sort of come at the same problem. Uh, Rita McGrath, who teaches at Columbia Business School uh -huh. and has, has for years, you know, so much I've learned from her about option value and, and strategy and about managing uncertainty. Um, Lucy Kung, uh, amazing sure. researcher and thinker uh, on, on the lessons from the media industry, which is really her field. And but mm. the ideas apply everywhere, and, and just you know, always love talking with her. And then there's just folks I who I don't know personally, but I love reading. Whether it's you know Tim Harford on sort of history of economics of innovation, um, mm. you know, some great writing by Donald Soule on strategy you know, as a conversation. Um, just listening to Benedict Evans this morning, you know, um, uh, you know great tech analyst. So yeah, it's, there's so many smart, interesting people out there. Um, oh. and I, I love soaking up ideas and, and, and taking them and trying to, you know, credit them and, and then, and then connect and build on them myself. Yeah. I always get excited when I remember where I got some idea that I've I yeah. started replaying <laughs> for others. Um, but, but Steve Blank and, and, uh, Dr. Rita McGrath have both been guests here on the, on this podcast, um, yeah. which, which is, which is great. Um, Fantastic. So those, there's, but you did name a couple of folks that I, I want to check out. Um, so let, let's make it about you. Um, where should our <laughs> listeners go to learn more about your work and, and about you? Um, well, first I'll mention the book just came out. Uh, Digital Transformation Roadmap is available on Amazon and wherever books are sold, as they say. <laughs> um, uh, and then, you know, I have a website. It's davidrogers.digital. So not the usual domain, mm -hmm. uh, .com or whatever. It's .digital. And you can find on that a lot of information about, uh, about my writing, about my work with companies, uh, speaking, executive workshops, and so forth. But you can also kind of sprinkle throughout any page. There'll be a little spot to sign up for my free newsletter, which is on Substack. And if you sign mm -hmm. up for that, you will get every week um, my thoughts on all these kinds of never ending issues and questions around driving change and value creation and, uh, and growth in established businesses. Uh, you will also get, if you sign up now, a, uh, a download of a free chapter of the book. So uh, if you're still mm. thinking about, hmm, this is interesting to me, uh, if you sign up for that, you can uh, take a look at the chapter one. Well, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And like I said, you know, we, we, I think we both know lots of leaders who are struggling with this question yeah. um, and how, how to get started and how to, how to, how to bring to bear the power of digital uh, to their businesses. So um, really great conversation with you today. I'm excited uh, to, to read the book more. Um, I, I skimmed it getting ready for this, but uh, looking forward to reading it end to end and, uh, and just can't thank you enough for being a guest on, on the Animation Engine. Oh, thanks so much, Scott. I really enjoyed it. And we'll have to do it again sometime soon. Sounds good. Let's do it. Thanks so much. Take care.